but I know this is a critical issue to Senator Vitter, and at this point, I'm going to turn uh, both the gavel and the time over to you, Senator Vitter. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Uh, thanks for calling and sharing this hearing. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, Mr. Wisner Gross, I, I want to step back and sort of start with the big picture in terms of some of the comments you suggested. Under the current system, we have SIPC. Um, we have this um, SIPC Good Housekeeping Seal logo, correct? Yes. And that is very widely used by SIPC members. I mean, they put it on all of their websites. On every, every statement. Yeah, every statement, every website, every piece of literature, every entry door, basically, because it is that sort of good housekeeping seal logo similar to FDIC. Would you agree with that? Yes, Senator. And yet the reality is, say, compared to FDIC, it's fundamentally different, and it's fundamentally less protection. Would you also agree with that? Yes, Senator. So it seems to me the big picture is that the average customer is sort of actively being misled, is given this good housekeeping seal. Member firms are actively using that for their benefit in the market. And it isn't there when customers need it in many cases. In fact, it's uh, most uncertain, it seems to me, correct me if you think this is wrong, but it's most uncertain in many outright cases of fraud versus simply failure. And it seems to me that's particularly ironic. Would you agree with that? Well, I'm not sure I'm going to go all the way with you on that comment. I, I do think that fraudsters will typically use the SIPC logo as a means of trying to lull their investors into thinking that it has SIPC protection. I don't know whether I'm prepared to go with you all the way to say it's being used by uh, the well-established brokerage firms uh, to somehow facilitate a fraud. I, I, but I do concur. No, 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 I didn't say that or didn't mean to suggest that. What I'm saying is when push comes to shove, often the victims who have most difficulty being made whole are victims of outright fraud versus other cases that is, of market failure. That is correct. And it seems to me that's particularly ironic that it's least certain in, in many cases of outright fraud versus market failure. I will agree with you. That's all I was trying to say. Um, now, now it, it's, it seems to me we should recognize this fundamental disconnect and correct it in some way. E either make that good housekeeping seal what it purports to be, or take it off everybody's doors and stop the complete misrepresentation. Uh, well, I, I will agree that uh, if it's going to be there, there should be an appropriate disclaimer right. so that people understand what is at issue. But I think more to the point, uh, as I've said in my opening remarks, I concur that you've properly framed the issue. And I think uh, the proposed legislation identifies several ways in which we, we can hopefully begin to rectify the problem. Correct. Isn't one of the big differences, I keep using this analogy with FDIC, because I think that's how consumers read that good housekeeping seal, isn't one big difference that SIPC has industry members who are clearly active, ongoing industry members who have vested interest in SIPC members and uh, private sector industry partners? I'll agree with you there as well. Do you think that poses a potential conflict? Yes, Senator, I think, uh, and there are various ways in which that could be addressed. Um, particularly if you have uh, a board that's truly independent. Correct. Um, do you have any particular thoughts about the best way to erase that potential conflict? Well, uh, the same broker-dealers are regulated by the SEC, and uh, typically when there's fraud, it's identified by the SEC. I, I don't have specific recommendations, but I think that you've correctly framed the problem. I think there has to be a better path to ensuring that SIPC, true to its mandate, is truly independent, truly looking out for the best interest of investors, and truly able to protect those uh, interests. And would one partial or whole solution being giving SEC more outright authority over SIPC 
uh, yeah, at least yes, in certain I, cases, I, including fraud. I 100% agree with you. And in fact, I endorse uh, the proposal of allowing the SEC to be able to initiate uh, SIPA proceedings. Um, and um, clearly, they have a, already a statutory right of oversight. I think it, it would be uh, in the best interest of everybody to have the SEC, which can shut down uh, firms after identifying fraud, also being much more intimately involved with the day-to-day -day operations <clears throat> and enforcement of those situations. Right. Mr. Harbeck, um, obviously I'm very concerned about the Stanford case. I represent a lot of Stanford investors. To date, how many of those Stanford investors have uh, gotten any recovery from SIPC? None, sir, as a result of the case of SEC versus SIPC, okay. where the court stated that the Stanford victims did not fall under the uh, statutory program that we administer. Okay. So I just want to make clear, we're talking about these other cases, 99%, great majority, blah, blah, blah. Stanford, just factual basis, want to be clear, everybody's been shut out of recovery. That is correct. Okay. CIPIC now let's walk, the through, let's walk through CIPIC's arguments for that because as I have followed them, they, they are changing. At the district court, let, let, me, let me just ask you if you can put in layman's terms, not hyper-technical terms, but in layman's terms, the grounds for SIPC not standing behind those investors. Senator, as you know, uh, the Securities Investor Protection Act is a complex statute. But if you would try to reduce it to uh, one sentence, in terms of what is protected and what is not protected. That sentence would be as follows. SIPC protects the custody function that brokerage firms perform for their customers and only the custody function. And in the Stanford case, it was our consistent view for the two years prior to that lawsuit that all of the customers uh, that the SEC knew of had their certificates of deposit or they were in the custody of a, um, uh, another uh, entity that had their certificates of deposit or they were book entry. CIPIC, You're basically talking about Antiguan CDs? That's correct. Okay. Look. All money went directly to the Stanford International Bank of Antigua or a bank account owned by the Stanford International Bank of Antigua, the CIPIC member brokerage firm was not holding any assets, nor was it supposed to be, for those customers. Now, Mr. Harbeck, that's, that's the argument that you all made in district court. You changed the argument when it got to appeal. I'll get to that in a minute, but let's start with the district court. Isn't it correct that those customers were issued these Antiguan CDs and there was never money in that Antiguan bank backing them up? That was a complete fraud. There was absolute fraud ab initio. However, was there money in the Antiguan bank backing up those CDs? There is some. There is an independent uh, entity or a receiver in the Stanford, uh, in Antigua, that is in charge of res restoring those customers to the extent he can. I don't know what that means. Was there money in that Antiguan bank backing up those CDs or not? Senator, we do not have investigatory authority. Certainly, we don't have it overseas. There has been forensic accounting that has shown that there was no money in that Antiguan bank backing up the CDs. Do you agree with that? Because that's the record. I, 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 I don't believe it's the record in the case that we litigated. I'll assume it's true. You will assume it's true? For purposes of discussion, of course. So in the district court, the argument is, well, this was an investment in a foreign bank that's not covered under the CIPIC law, under CIPA, but the money never reached the foreign bank. The CDs were issued. There was no cash backing them up. You don't think that's a problem with your argument? No, I don't, because the, uh, I, I don't agree with you in this regard. As far as I know and as far as the SEC stated, all monies either went to the Stanford International Bank or went to a bank account under its control. Well, you're talking about an SEC statement of facts submitted to the district court. That was incorrect. That is contrary to the forensic accounting. Are you aware of that? I'm aware that someone has submitted an affidavit saying the money did not go to Antigua. 
The SEC, when we asked them about that, did say that the money went to a, an American bank account owned by the Stanford International Bank of Antigua. An American bank account? Correct. Okay. So, so Mr. Harbeck, I think you are aware of what I just laid out, because when the case went to circuit court, you all changed your argument completely. That's not correct, sir. Well, in the circuit court, your primary argument was that somehow this was a loan from the customers to the broker-dealers, and there is a specific exclusion to cover that. Was that not a significant argument that, that was a made? That was, that was a in, secondary argument that we made in both courts, sir. And when these customers were buying CDs, you think they were loaning the broker-dealers money or investing in the broker-dealers? That is not what the court said. The court said- I'm asking what you said in terms of that particular argument. You made that argument. So do you think it was a fair characterization in making that argument that in buying CDs, these customers were loaning the broker-dealers money? The SEC argued that if you substantively consolidated these entities, then, then a SIPC member firm was holding assets for the debtor. Substantive consolidation never took place, point number one. But what the court said is that if it did, then people would be, uh, instead of lending money to the Stanford International Bank, which is what a CD is, it would be lending money to the brokerage firm, and that is not protected by statute. Right, except they had a CD, and they <laughs> never agreed to lend money to the brokerage firm. The brokerage firm stole the money, kept the money. That's cash. That's covered under SIPA. Cash is covered under SIPA. CD is covered under SIPA. And yet you all concocted this ridiculous theory that no, it, it wasn't a CD, even though the customer had a CD piece of paper. It wasn't cash, even though that's what the broker dealer stole and diverted. It was somehow a loan to the broker dealer, which obviously the customer never agreed to. Senator, I mean, don't, Senator, don't, your statement does not comport with the stipulated facts. Well, the stipulated facts were wrong and have been disproved by I, the forensic accounting. I disagree. Okay. Well, I think the broader point here is that um, I don't think an entity like FDIC would have spent tens of millions of dollars to do back somersaults to make those sorts of arguments. I think only an entity dominated by industry members would have done those back somersaults and spent tens of millions of dollars in legal fees to make those sorts of arguments. I guess that's my broader point. Let me go to Mr. Giddens, um, and I have another concern about the trustee relationship. And Mr. Giddens, I, I acknowledge you're a very competent person in the roles you've played, and I don't uh, question your competence or your integrity. I do question the conflict of interest between people who are named over and over and over as trustees, make a lot of money doing it, uh, and that person's role protecting the investors. And I think that is a built-in and serious conflict, that practice. So with that in mind, let me ask you, how many times have you and your firm uh, or your firm acted as a CIPIC matter trustee? I believe, uh, excuse me, I believe uh, in five or six cases out of the 300 cases over 45 years. So five or six cases? Yes. And roughly how much money do you think you and your firm have made doing that? Uh, I, I don't off the top of my head know. Uh, what I would say is one, I have never applied for compensation for myself as trustee in a personal capacity. Uh, the law firm, of which I'm a party, has to apply to the bankruptcy court for compensation. That compensation is on notice to all creditors, and after a hearing, the compensation has to be approved by a bankruptcy court and a bankruptcy judge. Uh, the cumulative amount of compensation, I do not know. In terms of the... Can you uh, give us a, a sense of proportion, a ballpark figure? I, re I really... Uh, Was it over a million dollars in each case? 
No, it was less less than a million in some cases, and over and over uh, several million dollars in, in other cases. Again, again uh, the compensation is governed by bankruptcy code uh, requirements, where the compensation should be based on results achieved. There's also a public interest discount. Uh, in terms of the, if I may, just comment on. I think I think you raise a legitimate question uh, on the conflict of interest. Uh, I would point out that. For example, in Lehman and MF Global, um, we've had adversary proceedings against uh, principal firms on Wall Street, uh, major, major issues involving billions of dollars and firms such as J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and the like. So it, it's not correct uh, that there is a bias uh, toward large Wall Street institutions. They equally have disputes with CIPIC and the SEC about what's covered, for example, repo transactions and things of that sort. Well, just to clarify, I wasn't talking about a bias there. I was talking about a bias of the trustee towards CIPIC. Because well, CIPIC hires a trustee, in some cases over and over. That's a major book of business. That's a major source of compensation for the firm. So that's the bias I was talking about. Okay. Just to give you an example, you weren't named trustee in Stanford. If you were, and if you had decided matters in terms of uh, customer status and compensation, contrary to the way CIPIC has fought, CIPIC has fought the SEC, CIPIC has gone to court, CIPIC has gone to circuit court, so has spent tens of millions of dollars on this. Do you think you'd be a prime candidate to be hired as a trustee the next time? I, I, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. If well, the, let me restate if, it. If, if, you're, if, you're if you were the trustee in Stanford, mm -hmm. and if you had disagreed with CIPIC mm -hmm. on this fundamental question of customer status and right to recovery, which well, CIPIC has fought tooth and nail to an extraordinary extent, SEC told them, Mm -hmm. to act otherwise, CIPIC fought the SEC, CIPIC went to court, CIPIC went to circuit court, mm -hmm. CIPIC spent millions of dollars fighting this, which obviously come out of the assets of uh, the um, fraudster. Uh, do you think, if you had fundamentally disagreed with CIPIC on that, do you think you'd be a prime candidate to be named a trustee in the next big CIPIC case? The answer is I, I don't know. The answer is I, if uh, I, the confusing part is if to be appointed a trustee or being suggested as a trustee by CIPIC to the district court, which has to appoint you, uh, that would mean that CIPIC had started a CIPIC liquidation of Stanford. And uh, if um, you know, I were the trustee, I would look at the statute. That would be my job. Obviously, I would um, discuss it with uh, CIPIC, the SEC, and other, others involved and try to reach a fair decision. I'm you know, sympathetic to um, you know, any group of people who are defrauded, and I think if, whether it's a CIPIC trustee or an independent trustee, you ought to use all your resources to try to find ways for recovery. There are other avenues may be not successful other than simply relying on the CIPIC fund. Right. Well, we can just disagree about this. I'll answer my own question. I think it's obvious that you wouldn't be on the short list by CIPIC the next time. And that's the conflict I'm talking about, similar to the conflict in terms of industry members of CIPIC. Uh, let me end on that note. First of all, thank you all very much for your testimony and your participation. I think this has been an important and a productive discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I am determined that this discussion moves to action in terms of appropriate reform, and I'm equally determined that there will be no confirmation of outstanding proposed CIPIC members uh, unless and until that reform happens. So I look forward to all of that. Thank you very much.